It was a normal Monday for radical Muslim cleric Hassan Mustafa Osama Nasser, better known as Abu Omar. He was walking to midday prayers at his local mosque when he noticed a white van. When he passed the gardens at Via Guerzoni, an Italian identifying himself as a police officer approached, asking to see his identification papers. Omar's recollection was of being grabbed by two men, now known to be CIA operatives. They threw him into the back of their van, placed a bag over his head and beat him as the vehicle sped off. As Abu Omar lay semi-conscious on the van floor, feet and hands shackled with tape and covered with a blanket, he wasn't to know he'd not see Italy again for years. According to Italian prosecutors, he was kidnapped by the CIA in a practice known as extraordinary rendition, where suspected terrorists are abducted and flown to a country where torture is commonplace to extract information. In Omar's case, it was Egypt. Back in his Cairo prison, Abu Omar wrote a letter. It was smuggled from his cell and delivered to the Milan prosecutor's office. It reads like a last testament and gives graphic detail of what Omar says he suffered at the hands of Egyptian interrogators. I write this from inside my tomb. The cell is two by one and a half meters, with no window and no way of telling night from day. I was called number 27, stripped naked, bound and blindfolded, beaten and tortured with an electric prod. They've beaten me so hard, I've lost my hearing. I've endured sexual violence, a torture I will never forget. Abu Omar has been released from his Cairo prison. His attempts to return to Italy have been barred by the Egyptian government. Even if Omar did return to Italy, he'd be immediately arrested and charged with terrorism offences. The latest Pentagon Mental Health Survey of US soldiers serving in Iraq found that at least a quarter of those returning after repeated tours had mental health problems. The surge has made things worse. This is Anbar, 55,000 square miles of territory. The surge tactics are to patrol as much as possible on foot but it takes hundreds of soldiers to cover the villages in this 10-mile stretch of the river. The forces suspect that weapons are smuggled across the river at night, so soldiers are authorised to destroy the fishing boats. But in order to ensure goodwill, they immediately offer compensation. But it comes with conditions. I understand that the Marines broke your boat, but if you want a new boat, you need to work with the Marines. You need to work with the Marines because we have a lot of... A lot of uh, Alibaba bring in the uh, yes, yes. weapons across the river. Yes. We find in a lot of weapons. Another day and the US military are on their way to another village, this time near Eilus. The few people left here claim that the US military are using execution squads and this has caused panic across all the villages in this region of the Euphrates. Although, as President Bush says, the surge has decreased the level of violence in some areas of Anbar, in these villages along the Euphrates, there's still a long way to go. It is a land of towering ice and blinding snow called Greenland. Legend has it that Viking explorers called it green to fool settlers into coming here. But 500 years after the Vikings abandoned it, southern Greenland really is turning greener. Since the mid-90s, the average temperature has risen by nearly two degrees. And the ice is melting. What may be bad for the planet is turning out to be great for Greenland. 
Warmer seas are bringing huge catches of cod. Farmers are enjoying early springs and growing seasons up to a month longer. To many scientists, Greenland is ground zero of global warming, a marker, if you like, of the kind of changes that will eventually sweep the planet with potentially catastrophic results. Now, of course, there are many sceptics who argue that the proof isn't there, that it's man-made, that it's anything more than the cyclical changes of nature. But whatever the cause, what Greenland does show is that a change of just a couple of degrees can fundamentally affect entire communities. While Magnusson's own problems are his immediate concern, it's the retreat of the ice cap that worries him most. It covers 80% of Greenland's interior. At its highest point, it's more than three kilometres thick. But the view from the air is disturbing. And this used to all this land that you're seeing here used to be covered up with ice 10 years ago. Really? Oh, yes. A year ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimated that melting ice could raise sea levels by 20 centimetres over the next 50 years. But the latest research from Greenland suggests it could be far worse. The melt is speeding up as newly formed streams push out ever more ice. On a dockside in war-torn southern Senegal, a rusting hulk lies impounded by the authorities, its English captain accused of people smuggling. The alleged involvement of a British citizen is a disturbing development in the ongoing tragedy of African migration, which has seen thousands die in a desperate bid to make it to Europe. But as the noose tightens around Dakar, desperate young men are turning to even more dangerous escape routes further south, in places like the conflict-torn region of Casamance, where the mysterious English cargo ship, the Salina, is held. So how did the Salina end up in this unhappy region? And what was she really up to? Our investigation began not in Africa, but in Portland, in Dorset. It was here, five years ago, that a retired handyman called Robert Thorne sold his house and bought a rusting old cargo boat for £70,000. Thorne had no qualifications as a captain and had never owned a ship before, but he did have big plans for the Salina. He launched a charitable company to run the ship and told the local Dorset paper he planned to fill her with medical aid and sail her to East Timor. Before long, Robert Thorne's dream started to unravel. For a start, his ship, the Salina II, was detained here by the authorities for being unseaworthy. But after several months trapped in the port, Robert Thorne and the Salina escaped under cover of darkness, owing thousands of pounds in mooring fees. It's a long way from Portland in the south of England to the mangrove swamps of southern Senegal. But this rusting hulk is the Salina too. It's five years since the British authorities condemned her as unsafe, and now she looks like a death trap, battered and leaking. Yet when she was seized by the Senegalese authorities, they claim she had 80 illegal migrants in her hold and was waiting for more. So why would anyone risk their lives in this rust bucket? According to local human rights activist Abdulaziz Mbai, it's because the journey on the alternative, the wooden pirogues, is even more dangerous. Meanwhile, on the open sea, young migrants continue to risk their lives for their European dream. Saturday, May the 19th. It's late afternoon in Baghdad. Photojournalist Sean Smith captures this image that resonates across America. Inside a Bradley armored car, six US soldiers and their translator are burning to death. 48 hours later and Specialist Lake's unit are back in the neighborhood. They're conducting random house checks. The day starts with second platoon called to investigate a blast at an insurgent bomb factory. 
an Iraqi soldier has taken the brunt of it. It's an ordinary day for the people of Baghdad, and from Apache Company, there's this message. I, I challenge the president or whoever has us here for 15 months to ride along alongside me. I'll do another 15 months if he comes out here and rides along with me every day for 15 months.